A regime that shoots on its own youth has no future. The words at the time, those of France's then president, François Mitterrand, in reaction to the Tiananmen Square massacre. When the crackdown ended more than five weeks of unprecedented student protests in China, it was 1989. Glasnost was on in the Soviet Union. The Berlin Wall was ripe for a fall. Tiananmen seemed like a prelude to what could only be the irreversible drive of history towards universal liberal multi-party democracy. Boy, was François Mitterrand wrong. Today, China's gone from strength to strength without the reform the youth demanded. In fact, the sacrifice has been airbrushed out of history, with a sizable portion of the nation's most, of the world's most populous planet completely unaware of what happened. Those who do know, like Chinese students abroad, often take a nationalist defense of their leadership. The only question now is whether the current consolidation and personalization of power under Xi Jinping flows directly from the line taken by the ruling Communist Party in those fateful days of 1989, or does it mark a break with the past that could now take the country in a completely new direction? Today, in the France 24 debate, we're looking at Tiananmen then and now, and with us, Lung Zhang, he teaches Chinese civilization at the University of Sergi Pontoise. 30 years ago, the young sociologist took part in the Tiananmen student movement. Well, thank you for joining us. Merci. Your, your story you. told in a new graphic novel, Tiananmen 1989, Our Shattered Hopes. Oui. Human rights activist Nancy Lee at the time helped Chinese dissidents who uh, were fleeing to Paris. And uh, you're a screenwriter for the documentary that's airing on the Franco-German television uh, station Arte, uh, entitled Tiananmen, The People Against the Party. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, La Croix Asia editor Dorian Malovic uh, covered the Tiananmen protest, was based out of Hong Kong at the time. Welcome yes. back to the show. Thank you. Uh, he's now a senior fellow at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Philippe Lecor covered the Tiananmen Square protests as uh, the Beijing correspondent for sister station Radio France International. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Now, there had already been student movements in China, most notably in 1986, calling for an opening up. That led to the resignation of the party general secretary, Hu Yaobang, when Hu died suddenly of a heart attack, April the 15th, 1989, the students returned to the streets. Nick Rushworth has more. In June 1989, student-led anti-corruption protests had been going on for weeks in Beijing and nationwide. The protesters called for democracy, freedom of the press, and freedom of speech. Anger had been fueled by the death of the pro-reform Communist Party leader, Hu Xiaobang. Students felt his heart attack was due to his forced resignation. That prompted them to gather in large numbers. The Goddess of Democracy statue became a central point for them as they occupied Tiananmen Square. Tension built with the students branded anti-party and anti-government. A hunger strike increased support for them. The government turned out to be divided on how to respond. However, hardliners gained the upper hand. Premier Li Peng announced martial law on the 20th of May and mobilized army divisions across the country. Two weeks later, the order was given to use any means to clear Tiananmen Square and areas occupied by protesters. They did so on the 4th of June, a day now associated with one person in particular, a protester nicknamed Tank Man, who came to symbolize defiance against authoritarianism. His name is not known. It is not known if he survived. When I see the picture of the man standing in front of the tank, I'm so proud for all Chinese people. It's the most essential way to show the whole world that the Chinese have the spirit of freedom. The death toll 30 years ago is not known, though it's put in the hundreds, possibly more. There was a subsequent crackdown on protest. Since June 1989, any political movement taking on the ruling Communist Party has been curbed. The events of Tiananmen 
are known worldwide, but far less so in China itself. Wu Chang, where were you on June the 4th, 1989? Uh, the next time I speak English, so today I'm very tired, so I prefer to speak in French. Euh, trop fatigué, oui, je suis hein, fatigué, je, je, presque malade. On m'a envoyé euh, en grande banlieue de Pékin pour me laisser I reposer un peu. I was sick, I was ailing at the time, and I was sent to the suburbs of uh, Beijing to get a rest and to prepare for what was to follow, because there was a risk that people like me would be um, arrested by policemen. We were preparing for the next steps. But I was sent to the suburbs two days before the massacre, so I got lucky. But I feel that I'm a survivor, and so it was a very heavy burden I carried with me. A feeling of guilt that you made it and others didn't? Yes. And, and, and the... Uh, uh, at the time, as we saw in that report, there had been forewarnings. The, there was the editorials in the, in the, in the state uh, newspaper, and there was that dry run, right, with the military the day before going around the square. That's right. I was in the suburbs of Beijing. Some other leaders came and joined me then. We, later, we separated again three, two or three days after that. And some of them were arrested after after that, but I, was, I got lucky. Before I ask, before I ask you uh, how you uh, lived through those days uh, around June the fourth, let's roll back the clock five weeks. April fifteenth, were you when the, when the protests began? What did you what did you think at the time? Well, I mean, obviously, the death of uh, Hu Yaobang, as your reporter commented, was the, the starting point of this, this whole movement. Uh, but of course, uh, the visit by uh, Soviet leader uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was also what attracted the attention from the news in particular uh, during all these weeks with uh, reporters coming from all around the world that sort of... Uh, you know, made the event so such a worldwide uh, piece of news that went on until until June. So the the, the crackdown of June fourth, uh, which we are sadly commemorating today, was a response to this outburst of, of students and uh, of, of of workers and of, of of life, really, of people that were out there to express themselves. Uh, uh, about the, the system, which they utterly uh, criticize. Although they never ask for uh, the demise of the Communist Party, they never ask for full democracy. They ask for, uh, um, you know, a dialogue with the, with the state, uh, with the authorities, and they ask to be considered. And uh, as you remember, they actually uh, went on a hunger strike, 400 of them, no less. And that didn't actually uh, work. The, the, the best they got was the visit by uh, former Secretary General Zhao Ziyang, who, who lost his job the day after. What we're seeing in those images, Dorian, yeah. the, it's, it's uh, the, people, the people who are riding around Beijing on bicycles, it's still a city yeah. of bicycles at the time, a reminder that this was a very different China. Really, that's, ago. that's very good. Point because I was watching that, and at the time I went in April and, and in May I walked from Beida University to, to Tiananmen walking. At the time there was no phones at all. I mean, you had a phone in the university, you had a phone in the hotels, but you didn't have mobile phone. So that means you had to rely on specific connections, going back to the hotel to work and to send your articles. And okay, it was another period. You had to walk, you had to talk with the people. I was a young journalist, my Chinese was very poor, but then anyway, we could, we could communicate. I, I, I was stressed, we saw this picture, it's June 5th. It's not June 4th, the tank man. 
there is a big mistake, I mean, misunderstanding about this tank man. I mean, the tank man, everything is already done. I mean, the, the, the plaza, the, the Tiananmen Square is already uh, uh, vanished. It's cleaned by the army during the night. So that's the next, that's the day after. All right. In the middle of the Tiananmen Square protest, Mikhail Gorbachev, as Philippe Lecol was saying, mm. comes to Beijing. Yeah. The four-day Sino-Soviet summit with Deng Xiaoping, oh, yeah. the first formal meeting between the leaders of uh, these neighboring rivals, well, since the 1950s. And uh, Nancy Lee, there's some who say that, well, um, the fact that these protests are going on when Gorbachev is in Beijing for such an important summit, that that really rankled Deng Xiaoping. Oh, it was a major face loss. Yeah. That is true. On the other hand, don't, you know, the sun does not rise and fall for Deng Xiaoping. The students, many of the students, were there to greet Gorbachev. Gorbachev was a special leader. He was not like a, he's not, he's not a Western leader. He's not Ceausescu. He's not Honecker. He's from Soviet Union, and he put the word perestroika in the dictionary. The, the, it's, a, it's great inspiration for the students who were there. They were, many of them, were there to greet him. And um, the, the, the regime, the Chinese government, was too rigid. They were the ones who got themselves into this cul-de-sac of face loss. They could have just asked Gorbachev to come later. They can't, they couldn't, they, they just... They blocked themselves into, into this cul-de-sac. Hang on, they couldn't? Uh, are you suggesting that they were too locked into their mentality? They were unable exactly. to do that? Exactly, they're too rigid. Uh, just think, remember that that was the beginning of CNN. And I think the Chinese authorities didn't realize that it was broadcasted live by CNN. We don't remember the first period of CNN, but we got the pictures because then thanks to CNN, BBC, but live all day. Uh, otherwise, they didn't, they were very in their closed flats and apartments and offices, and they didn't realize that all of it, all the world was watching. Uh, Lun Chang, you're a sociologist. Yeah. You went to uh, Tiananmen Square uh, to find out, well, what, what citizens wanted. What did they want? To understand the 1989 movement, you need to understand that on the one hand, it's a movement that was born out of the reform, 10 years of reform that have had consequences in terms of more freedom, more information. Yes, and more Chinese people who started wanting to see the rest of the world. But at the same time, this movement was born of the blockage of the reform because in the late 80s, because of the conflict between the conservative and the reformist camps within government, the reform was blocked simply. And so the students at the time wanted more democracy, more freedom, including in order to help reformers continue with their reforms. And so I, I insist. Uh, on one thing, the 1989 movement was not a revolutionary movement that tried to topple the regime. It is a reformist movement that tried to move China, help move China forward towards more freedom. Unfortunately, the authorities responded through more archaic methods and more violent methods and broke a hope, a rare hope. Uh, for any nation to have a consensus and and move forward based on that consensus. So uh, you you agree with Nancy yeah. Lee yeah. when she talks about um, the fact that Gorbachev yeah, yeah, and good. what he was trying to do, his reform, his opening, inspired the Chinese. W Exactly. At, at that time, as I've just told you, with the blockage of the reform in China, Gorbachev became a reference. At the time of the visit of Gorbachev to China, some students noted that Deng Xiaoping was 85 and that Gorbachev 
on se serve de visite de uh, Gorbachev et aussi ce, cette and révérence so de Saint-Paul pour this visit revendiquer plus d'ouverture uh, politique. Like Gorbachev and this symbol to ask for more yeah. opening well, well, of the John country. Yes. Um, what he says is true, and we, when we think about asking for, in China, asking for more freedom, right now it seems to be asking for the moon. In the, in the late 80s, it was not asking for the moon. During the 80s, uh, China was very open politically and economically, and there was this progression toward more opening, toward uh, more freedom. So it was not asking for the moon at the time, it was just pro a progressive development. And uh, Philippe Lecor, uh, that, that battle between reformers and conservatives within the party, when you were reporting for RFI, how, do, how did you sense it at that moment? So it was very difficult to know what was going on. And in fact, things haven't changed that much, you know, when it comes to the Communist Party of China. But basically, you know, they were the reformists. The, 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 those who inherited Hu Yaobang's uh, uh, principles of opening politically, uh, opening the door politically, following up the open door policy that Deng Xiaoping had introduced. But of course, there were also the conservatives and Chen Yun in particular, who was an economist, but there was also mm -hmm. Yang Shangkun, mm -hmm. who was the president at the time mm -hmm. and who was a general and whose brother was a general and who was involved in the crackdown uh, itself uh, on June 4th, in the night of, of June, June 3rd. Do, do you uh, agree so on people, that score, Philippe? Uh, that the, do you agree on that score with, with Nancy Lee, that history could have gone another way in China? It's good. You know, it's very difficult to rewrite history. And, and you know, when you speak to people now, I mean, obviously, there's this, uh, you know, somebody has called this the People's Republic of Amnesia. Uh, people, the, the authorities have been, have managed to erase uh, Tiananmen from the, the, the Chinese uh, memory, from the people. And, and, and in fact, you know, many people are just ignorant about it these days. Whether it could have become a democracy, of course, there's no tradition uh, of democracy in China. The only example that we have is Taiwan, uh, which is a full-fledged democracy these days. Um, but, you know, obviously, it's a complicated country. There is no tradition. But, but I think more opening would have served China very well. And I think, you know, they, you know had the Zhao Zeyong uh, faction won the, 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 this, uh, this in, internal battle, it would have been different. I don't know whether it would have been able to continue. I think most probably uh, Deng Xiaoping was, you know, uh, was worried about the, you know, the, the, the party itself. How China remembers or not, uh, as Philippe Lecor was saying, what happened 30 years ago. We're going to talk about it with our panel. When we come back, you're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 a debate. We're marking the day 30 years ago when tanks rolled into Tiananmen Square and uh, crushed what had been more than five weeks of uh, peaceful protests at the time, a turning point for, uh, for China and for the world. We're talking about it uh, with uh, Lun Zhang, sociologist who teaches at uh, the uh, University of Sergi Pontoise and who was there at the time. Also with us, activist Nancy Lee, uh, who uh, helped uh, Chinese dissidents who fled to Paris. Uh, he uh, is uh, the Asia editor for French daily newspaper La Croix Dorian Malavik, who at the time was based out of Hong Kong and uh, who uh, came in and out yeah. uh, both to Beijing and to Shanghai at the time. And Philippe Lecor at the time worked for sister station Radio France International uh, in Beijing. Today, he is a senior fellow at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Welcome back uh, to all of you. Uh, uh, Lun Zhang, uh, you, uh, before the break, uh, were telling us that you were too ill. To, uh, to take part on the day. To, you, were, you weren't there on the day. You were ill because you'd uh, been on a hunger strike. 
Oui, oui, c'est un côté que j'ai fait un peu yes. très de fin. Yes, j'ai fait un hunger strike, mais je suis en train d'être en charge de maintenir l'ordre sur le Tiananmen Square. Et après que le marché de l'ordre a été instauré, j'ai aussi été chargé d'organiser la résistance pour arrêter les avancées de l'armée. Et donc, j'étais juste exhausté. Je ne pouvais même pas dormir la nuit. Et à un certain point, j'ai même fainté. Um, and, and then I was carried to um, the, the hospital. I mean, the, my body just couldn't uh, handle it, and I was sent to a, the far suburbs of uh, Beijing two days before uh, the, the massacre so that I could get a, a rest, and so I, I escaped that massacre. And I want to insist on one thing. Uh, for all these years, The regime's propaganda created a confusion in the minds of the people, not just in China, but also abroad. What do I mean by that? What they said was that if we don't crack down um, on this movement, there won't be stability or economic development in China. And that's exactly wrong, because my role and the role of all these students who did everything was, it was to avoid any kind of disorder, public dis disturbance. It was a, a peaceful movement. And so in order to crack down on the movement, the regime used that um, pretext of, of keeping law and order, and it's still doing that after all these years. And I think this is, this is a lie. Historically, uh, it doesn't hold water. And then one more thing that I wanted to say is that a lot of people think that without the, the crackdown, or rather that because or with the crackdown, China was better able to develop uh, economically. That is wrong, too. Um, after the crackdown, the government felt that it needed to do a number of things to open a little bit, and that helped. But since the beginning, a little more space was given, but the political space was completely closed. And so we see, you know, corruption, um, inequalities, um, all these signs of a, a, a social crisis in China uh, after the, the slowdown, the economic slowdown. Th this is all too visible. Uh, Lun Sheng, you and, and uh, Nancy Lee, uh, both in part one, praising Mikhail Gorbachev, viewers watching us in Russia. Many of them see him as the symbol of the uh, instability that was to follow there during the 1990s. This Monday, uh, the uh, Chinese government uh, saying that the crackdown immunized China against political turmoil. You know that this kind of comparison is completely false. You, you need to know that before the movement, there had been 10 years of reforms that had been fruitful. It's, it was not like the, the Soviet Union. Uh, the consensus of the nation or within the nation to go for more reforms was strong. Everybody agreed that the nation had to reform itself. But compared with the conservative camp, um, students wanted more reforms. To, they wanted to go faster, but we wanted to support the authorities to have more reforms in place and eradicate corruption, which we saw emerging at the time. And so if China hadn't cracked down on the protesters, uh, China would have even uh, more law and order today. And so if you forget all of that, if you repress all of this history, how can you, how can you improve as a nation? The fact that uh, China is really strong is a bit of a... Uh, 
illusion. It's also a very fragile country. The power is extremely fragile. Uh, it's a rare contradiction in the history of any nation around the world to see this much power and this much fragility at the same time. And this all started in 1989. Yeah, and uh, on this point, Nancy Lee, very briefly. Okay. I totally agree with uh, Zhang Lun. The opposite of white is black. The opposite of beautiful is ugly. The opposite of democracy is not economic development. I mean, um, I don't know how even Westerners start to uh, repeat that kind of argument, that it's not an argument. And but it's been students, 30 years. It's been 30 years. And the students at the time, they were sympathetic to Zhao Ziyang, who was the spearhead of economic reform. It was the conservatives who were against the reform. And everybody wants to forget that. All right. On, on Sunday, China's defense minister made news when instead of skirting the issue or playing it down, he squarely defended the crackdown. It was during a press conference at a summit in Singapore. Do you think the government was wrong with the handling of June 4th? There was a conclusion to that incident. It was political turmoil the central government needed to quell. The government was decisive in stopping the turbulence. That was the correct policy. What do you make of the fact that he is unabashed? Because this is stronger talk than we've heard, stronger language than we've heard in the past from the Chinese leadership. Oh, they, are, they are saying that for years. But then what, what was strange, it, it was in Singapore, you know, uh, the Shangri-La countries, speaking about regional, regional security. And one journalist had the courage to ask the questions about that. But that's what they are saying since 1989. They justify uh, the crackdown on saying that was counter-revolutionaries threatening the peace and stability of the country. So we couldn't, we couldn't let them go on forever like this, and we made the, the right decision to, to crack down. He recognized, he's recognizing, in a way, what happened, which is rare. A big step. A big step. I mean, re recognizing that there was turmoil. Turmoil, you know? It, it, it's not always like turmoil. You say about incidents or kind of turbulence, but How, then he said turmoil. However, what he said is not even reported back in China, oh. because you are not allowed to say June 4th. <clears throat> so whatever he, he was doing, he was exercising a right that he does not have in China yeah, by mentioning it, and he was actually what the Chinese called slapping yeah, himself. I agree with what Nancy has just told us. If it was such a good idea to crack down on the movement, why did Chinese authorities spend 30 years doing everything to erase the traces, the slightest traces of what happened? If you do the right thing, why would you be ashamed of what you've done? Philippe Lecor, uh, do you agree that... Uh, you know, the facial recognition, the great firewall of China, the censorship, the fact that nobody mentions June the 4th, that it makes Xi Jinping a leader with a, a giant with a feet of clay? Well, of course, it depends which public you're addressing. If you are in Singapore international, uh, addressing an international forum, you can afford to say that. And I, I'm sure he was on message. And he also addressed Xinjiang, strangely enough, and saying it was also correct to harass the Uyghur population. But if you're addressing the, the people of China, the 1.4 billion people living in China, that you know, 99% or perhaps 95% have never heard about Tiananmen. Uh, this is a completely different message. Basically, there is no uh, messaging about this, and nobody talks about it. What I find a little bit strange about this amnesia process is the fact, you know, uh, China doesn't seem to mind talking about uh, the opium wars and, and, and the war against Japan. Uh, there's no amnesia for that, you know. <laughs> and as far as Xi Jinping is concerned, well, it's you know he's obviously um, a very strong man uh, on the surface. He travels around the world. He's got a, a grand vision for China to to uh, you know the renaissance of China, the Chinese dream. Now, of course, that doesn't include uh, a democracy or human rights. That's for sure. Uh, 
But, you know, at the same time, why is such a strong party, a strong leader, so reluctant to, 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 to tell its people about history? And again, this is only 30 years of history. So uh, it's quite possible that for the next 30 years, people will, will not learn about it. But eventually they will, because of course, the, the people of Beijing who were so brave in 1989 have not forgotten, at least those who are still alive, no, those who lost their children, and, and who gather you know, uh, in a very quiet way uh, every year and of course, that's Hong Kong, 200,000 people uh, tonight <laughs> gathering in Victoria Park uh, to commemorate the, the, the June 4th um, crackdown in Beijing. Yeah, the big uh, the candlelight vigil in Hong Kong. And as Philippe was mentioning, no commemorations inside China for what is sometimes and referred China. to as the June 4th incident. Our correspondent, Charles Pellegrin, sent us this report. The Chinese authorities refuse to acknowledge the massacre. The pain I have in my heart will never go away. These memories will never go away. If they recognized the massacre, I would be relieved. My son isn't the only case. There are so many other victims. This doesn't just concern my family. It's the entire country's tragedy. Today in China, no one talks publicly of the events of the spring of 1989. The younger generation either knows nothing about it or avoids the topic altogether. In China, remembering Tiananmen is taboo, but not in semi-autonomous Hong Kong, where some want to keep the memory alive. While Chinese media censors any mention of the massacre, this radio station gives a voice to those who witnessed the tragedy. In 1989, Esther Lung was 29 years old. I witnessed the massacre. I saw several dead bodies being transported to the hospital. That's the truth, and we can't stop telling it, even 30 years later. And we turn to the former Hong Kong correspondent, Dorian Malovic. Again, mm. the, the huge uh, candlelight vigil uh, yeah. this uh, this Tuesday in Hong Kong, and it comes at a time when citizens there feel as though their own rights are, are yeah, under threat. For, for, I, I can feel very strong for Hong Kong people now, but just to remind, like in 1989, what happened in Beijing was a dramatic shock for the Hong Kong people. They didn't have any political consciousness at the time. Hong Kong was a colony. It was OK. It was still it was not, British. Still British. It was not slavery. It was not like unbearable. Life was OK. But in 1984, China and Great Britain signed a joint declaration about the handover of Hong Kong in 97. So the people in Hong Kong suddenly realized that from 89 to 97, in a few years, they were about to be part of Beijing country, even though there is the two country, uh, the two, um, one country, two system concept. So now they are still uh, reviving every year for 30 years, this period of 89. The people are really, they were shocked. And the transmission of history and the memoir is, is, is really active in Hong Kong. I met, I know people from Hong Kong for 30 years now, they transmitted to their children. And the young people in Hong Kong, I can tell you, in contrary with the Chinese people, they know what is 1989, 4th of June. So Hong Kong is a, is a great chance for the world to remember what, what happened. The question is now for them, for how long? Because Beijing is really, really cracking on Hong Kong for five years now, has been cracking for five, six, seven years on the freedom of speech, freedom of the press. And there is this big extradition law that is going to be discussed at the parliament for Hong Kong. Lun Zhang, do you uh, resent it when uh, you see the leaders of France, the UK, Germany, the US go and do business with China? Je ne suis pas si naïve que ça. D'un côté, euh, 
Well, I'm not that na naive. Uh, I'm not that innocent. I know it. This is normal. I, 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 I can't ask Westerners or Western uh, heads of state or a government um, to act in any other way. But even in these leaders' interests, you need to remember and you need to know what the nature of the regime is. Even if you're doing business, the beauty of having Xi Jinping, who uh, as a neo-Maoist is uh, deploying so many technologies and resources to uh, put lawyers in prison to control everyone to, and, and launching his uh, uh, Silk Road policy and creating a very aggressive image for himself. And so if Westerners don't know who they're dealing with, and refuse to understand it, you yourselves will lose your dear democracy. And so this commemoration of the 4th of June is not just for the Chinese. It's also something that the whole world needs to commemorate. And it is a reminder of what the nature of this regime is. Philippe Lecor, uh is Donald Trump right uh, to uh, warn his uh, Western allies against using Huawei technology in the context of what you've just heard from Lun Zhang? Well, that, that's, uh, that's another long topic. I mean, I think obviously it, it's, it's to do with the, the Sino-American uh, trade war, but mo most probably a long-term conflict between the two uh, nations. Uh, I would say that, you know, going back to what you, you the question you, you posed earlier, um, it is a problem that, that Western leaders prefer discussing the market access uh, in China than human rights or, yeah. or, or you know, uh, other civi civilian issues. Uh, the reason is, of course, people, I mean, China itself has been advocating for this great market, or consumer market, which is not as great as a lot of people actually think. It's been quite difficult to do business in China. At the same time, uh, China prefers talking about this and, and, and has been putting pressure on Western leaders and say, well, if you're giving us a hard time about our, our domestic politics, you won't, be, uh, have, you won't have any access to our market. It's going to be even tougher. It's already quite tough. But, you know, Western leaders now prefer discussing about the role of state-owned enterprises, the market access, and, and, you know, 5G technology and Huawei, for example, which is a problem. Huawei has received subsidies from the Chinese states, which is, you know, unfair practice in the West, which is a problem for a number of countries, including in Europe. So, you know, there, there are lots of issues, but it's not, there's, there's no excuse to erase what happened in the past, what happened 30 years ago, and, and to become amnesiac again. And again... Thanks to Trump. I must say, you, I mean, you cannot deny that whatever we think about Trump, whatever Trump is, we, European Union is just behind Trump against China because we were not united enough to fight against the Chinese lies on business, the Chinese lies on manipulation of the business and of this market in China, which was an illusion in a way. You can ask a lot of businessmen there. They wouldn't tell you because otherwise it's finished for them. But we are behind Trump. And whether it's a Sino-American thing, EU can at last be conscious of now we have to be very careful because China is lying all the time. Talking about trade, let me ask you a question. This is a, a TV channel. How many TV channels financed by the Chinese government can you watch in France or the US? How many Western channels, TV channels, can you watch from China? Where is the quality? And so you can't have Google in China, but all the Chinese are trying to be free to do more business abroad. So even in terms of trade exchanges, if Westerners start asking themselves these questions, uh, this will be interesting. Are these terms of trade fair? Nancy Lee, when you think back to 1989 and you helped uh, people who were coming out of, uh, of China at the time who had to escape 
at the time, we thought it would just be a brief pause, right? That, uh, that, that it was inevitable. The march of history was going towards liberal democracy everywhere. It, Did you it, think that at the time? Everything was so grotesque. Who would think of the use of tanks as crowd control? Um, but did you think that, okay, maybe it's, it's been crushed this time, but it'll, they'll be back soon? Uh, I was more hopeful then um, because the, the, the 1980s was a more hopeful period and all the way up to 1989. And I want to also tie into the uh, connect with the um, point about um, Western leaders doing business in China. Uh, inside the escape network that helped people like Zhang Lun to escape, there were several French diplomats mm. Uh, who were very crucial in their role, and they have not been able to speak um, because of their work. And now I can cite some of their names, like uh, Mr. Montagne, uh, Mr. Fensterbank, Mr. Paul Jean Ortiz. Um, they helped people. They These helped were diplomats people. in post in Beijing. Posted in Hong no, Kong. In Hong Kong. In Hong Kong. Who helped? Uh, they 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 established the Hong Kong Paris Tunnel, mm. uh, helping mm. uh, distance who were. Uh, hiding out in Hong Kong to get to Paris. Mm. And that's, the, they, they acted, mm. they were just being themselves. They were being French. They were um, keeping in mind the Falanxi Jingshen, the spirit of France. And that's all I ask of them is that be yourselves. Don't, you have to, you have to embrace your own principles. Is that too hard to do? Nancy Lee, we're going to have to leave it there. Unfortunately, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank as well Lung Zhang for being with us, Dorian Malovic, and also want to thank uh, uh, Philippe Lecal for being with us uh, from Harvard University. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to James Creedon. Hi, Francois. So a quick look at some of uh, the online uh, elements uh, related uh, to uh, the theme of this today. You can see um, still uh, attempts to keep the media uh, away from Tiananmen Square when they're trying to report this. One CNN reporter put up this video uh, online. We should get an image of it now. We don't really need sound, but what you can see is plainclothes police officers uh, attempting to get in the way of uh, any reporting uh, done on site. So, yes, this is something that is, is, is showing that there's still an attempt uh, 30 years later to, to, to really repress any information uh, related uh, to what happened. Um, lots of uh, coverage of various artists or uh, figures who are drawing attention to, uh, attention, uh, to this. In particular, uh, there, there's one, uh, one artist um, who, has, who's been, who has been quite vocal, the political cartoonist Badiou Kao, I think that's Badiou pronounced Kao. correctly. Uh, he decided to unveil his face for the first time because mm. he has been very discreet about his identity. Mm. He's very critical of the Chinese authorities uh, and of the Communist Party, but he has they unveiled his face in the last uh, few days for the first time. He's Australian uh, Chinese. He has recounted in the past how in 2007, as a law student, he was looking at a pirated movie when suddenly it cut to a documentary that had been spliced in about what happened in Tiananmen Square. And as a law student in 2007, he was shocked. He didn't know about this. He was completely uninformed. And this was inside uh, China? This was inside China. So he, he goes on to explain how that was a key seminal moment in his life which, which made him turn towards activism and indeed you can see uh, various examples of that. This is him uh, dressed as Tank Man, of course, who is the iconic, iconic figure from Tiananmen Square. That's in Adelaide, Australia in 2016. He, has, he and his family members have been threatened, uh, you know, very recently in fact. So it, he, he, he is still vocally speaking out and has mm. gone so far now as to show his face uh, for the first time. Another artist, uh, very well known of course, uh, is, is Ai Weiwei. Uh, he has this piece in The Guardian today where he's very critical of the West, saying that they are complicit in this 30-year cover-up uh, of Tiananmen Square. Uh, he says uh, that what occurred on the 4th of June is not merely a Chinese issue. It is not simply an event that happened 30 years ago. Injustice is timeless. And he goes on to talk about the tolerance of injustice, uh, I suppose, by uh, other countries uh, which, who supposedly have lofty... Uh, 
uh, what would you say, morals in this regard or, or, or virtues. The tolerance of injustice and distorted information is an act of encouragement and complicity. And so he then says, we will all pay the price for this uh, failure uh, in, in continuing, uh, to, it, you know, it continues to reject fundamental values of openness, social justice uh, and freedom. So harsh words, I think, mm. for, uh, I suppose, the West in many in many senses in that regard. Um, just a, a quick nod mm. to the younger generations in Hong Kong, which has always been, of course, a, a centre for a commem remembering Tiananmen. Apparently, a lot of those younger generations feel uh, a little bit less attached to these commemorations. Uh, many perceive the vigil as promoting the vigil within Hong Kong as promoting Chinese nationalism, which emotionally binds Hong Kong people to the Chinese nation and diverts attention from Hong Kong's struggle for democracy. So that's just a little nuance. Uh, there is a split. Some of them are feeling. The younger generations kind of feel, look, is this really our battle at the end of the day? All right, James Creedon, I want to thank you. Thanks so much well. more to yeah. talk about. I want to thank our panel again. Thank you for joining thank us here in the France 24 debate.